I realize some of you may not be familiar with these gentlemen, but also where they race or where they raced and, and their accomplishments. And I'll start with Dell uh, Warsham on the end there. He is a drag racer. He's a champion. He's driven the top fuel cars and the uh, funny cars. And uh, let me ask you, first of all, tell us what kind of horsepower and the acceleration and the fuel kind of things like that and the engine configuration. Hi, yeah, my name is Dell Warsham and thanks for having me here this morning. Uh, so yeah, I race in the, and I compete in the funny car class in the NHRA Mel Yellow Series. Uh, last year I was 2015 world champion. I've uh, been racing now for 26 years. Go, this is my 26th season racing, and uh, we're up to upwards of 10,000 horsepower. No game, stayed, go. Couple of hundreds advantage, foul, oh, Dell's car makes a move, how did he win that thing? Whoa. Are you kidding me? Dell Worsham goes 404 at 272 miles an hour. Fast Jack goes 407 at 286 miles an hour. And in a coasting race, the mosh pit is on, Dell Worsham by five thousandths of a second. The guy Burn nitromethane, they're, they're there, supercharged. Uh, cars weigh about 2,500 pounds, including the driver. And, uh, and we just do an acceleration for what now is 1,000 feet. We, uh, we race quarter mile for forever. And uh, about 2008, the cars were accelerating so fast and going so fast and reaching speeds of over 330 miles per hour that, that stopping became an issue. So the, an easy, quick solution was just to shorten the racetrack so we didn't go as far, and that gave us a, a little bit of extra distance to try and stop these cars. Again, they burn nitromethane, which is where the power comes from. It's a fuel that carries its own air, and it'll actually burn with no atmosphere. So we're not really limited to conditions outside as like a normally aspirated car would be or a gasoline burning car methanol uh, if the air is really bad and there's not very burnable we can just up the percentage of nitromethane and make just as much horsepower as we need it's it's an amazing fuel that uh, puts out tremendous torque you know upwards of 15,000 foot pounds of torque and 10,000 horsepower been as quick as 3.7 seconds in the thousand feet at over 330 miles per hour um, with that definitely comes some dangers and uh, it's it's a it's an exciting sport did I uh, hear that correctly, 10,000 horsepower? 10,000, 10, which is a little bit of an estimate because really there isn't a dyno out there, you know, you can really put an engine like this on to even, even measure it. It's a, there are calculations with the weight of the car and the acceleration and how fast it goes, what it takes to, to achieve this, and uh, it, it, they're, they're like it has to be somewhere in that area or else you just couldn't pull off what's, what's going on. Del, can you go back 26 years, talk about the cars and the, you know, also your equipment Sure. Uh, listen to Brian talk about fire. 26 years ago, that was a huge, huge issue with funny car racing was fire. Um, when I first started driving, we, didn't, we did have fire suits, and they, and they were five layers thick. But like you said, lots of people were waiting to drive behind you. No one really talked much about it. And as far as containment and safety, the oil pan was exposed right to the ground, which went right to the driver. The cars were very hot. They ran very lean. The, the technology for cylinder heads and superchargers were getting way ahead of fuel systems. So cars ran very lean and got very hot and the oil technology. It didn't take much to have to, to blow a rod, go against the, the, the headers and start it. what could be a huge fire at over you know, 250 to 300 miles per hour. And that's a pretty nice wall, pop, boom. Del Worsham lights the one light and lights it up. And you know what? The guy in the car on fire going 300 miles an hour is the safest guy in the Coletta camp, camp right now. Matt Hagen goes 398, 324, comes up short. Dell goes 3.964, 320 miles an hour. First five years, I probably suffered up to upwards of 10 major fires. Uh, I learned right away in the fires, the fire, the, the safety equipment and the, and the fire suits were doing a pretty good job, but I couldn't breathe. You know, I was having to hold my breath, you know, at 270 miles per hour, and there's no parachutes, and the car is sliding and trying to use the brakes and, and hold my breath. And after probably about my fifth or sixth fire, I'm like, you know what, this just isn't going to work out. And I got a hold of, a, of an individual who, uh, who was building some stuff for, for drag boat racers. And he had this little safety canister that, that divers use, like a spare air for a diver. And uh, I, went, I went and saw him, and I said, look, I, I can handle the fire. I can, I, I can handle the speed. I just can't hold my breath that long. You know, what, what do I do? And he, uh, he rigged up this little, this little concoction thing that actually had a spare air that went up and we went down to the surplus store and got this fire hose off, off like a fighter jet. It wouldn't burn and we, and we rigged it up to that and put a mouthpiece in my helmet and it was kind of an on-demand where I had to bite on it and suck air but there would be clean air there. And uh, my third fire in, in 1994, uh, 
was just, it was just blazing, you know, and I remember just holding my breath and I remembered I had this bite piece and I took this big old breath and uh, I was able to keep my head together long enough that, uh, that, that the car slammed in the guardrail and it slid to the end and uh, the biggest problem I had were, was the fire coming in were my eyes. It was burning through the visor and I was covering up my eyes trying not to get burned and, and the, the gloves opened up. I ended up with third degree burns and have a, a part of my butt on my hand also, so I try not to smell this hand. <laughs> but it's a, uh, uh, we have got through it, uh, spent 21 nights in the burn center in, in, in New Jersey. I, I spent three months in an outpatient, left New Jersey and went straight to the drag strip in Seattle and was back in top fuel at this time. I decided funny car, that was it for a little while. I better, I better, I better try something different. And of course, uh, funny car, engine in front, and it still is today, right, still is. right there. You're, your knees are folded up there just for the engine accommodation. Right. Uh, the top fuel car is rear-engined. Rear-engined, exactly. So you want to get that fire. The fire behind, behind you. But in funny car, you know, there, there's, there's this thing. We have a firewall in there, and it's 40,000 thick aluminum, and you think it's going <laughs> to save you, and it doesn't. It's a, usually the first thing that happens is the body blows up, and the fire comes right back, and uh, it's, it's on you at that point. What kind of evolution did you see in your car? Okay, yeah, several since then. Uh, fires actually aren't very common anymore, and even, even crashing is not real common. But the uh, first thing we did was contain the parts, you know, on the engine. We, we have these big ballistic blankets that go around the, the lower, lower engines that contain the parts and try and keep them off the, heart, the, the hot parts, the hot exhaust, to try and contain, contain the uh, fires. Uh, another big thing that came along was the fresh air system in the helmet. So if the car does catch on fire, we're pumping fresh air in there. I have a little valve I can turn. It pressure, kind of pressurizes the helmet, and, and breathing in smoke really isn't an issue anymore. You can keep a good clear head. You can get the car stopped and get out. Yeah. Uh, the oil. There's been advances in oil today that, uh, that have like fire retardants in it that will really, uh, the, big, the big oil fires we had 20 years ago, you just don't see them. If we see a fire today, it's probably a fuel fire. It's going to go out pretty quick. Uh, with, with the safety equipment we wear today, you know, it's designed to protect you from these fires, so yeah, yeah. it's really come a long ways along. Another factor in, in safety is, of course, the track. In drag racing, people would say, you're going in a straight line. So what can possibly happen? First off, it's going fast, and you know, a drag race car is going so fast that lift, you know, you could get lift pretty easy if something did go wrong. Uh, my teammate, Larry Dixon, Back uh, years ago, you know, he had several wrecks where his front, you know, it has, has wings, front and rear, top fuel car. And if one of them happens to fail, be it the front or the rear, the car will just catapult and catch air and just start flying through the air and get over these guardrails. That's the one big thing, obviously hitting each other out there, you know, if two cars get into each other, you know, we're designed to go in our own lanes, not touch anything, not touch anybody. That could be a big issue. And then the runoff, you know, if a car can't stop, if your parachutes don't deploy for some reason, fire burns them off, or you have a, a braking issue, uh, you end up at the end of the track and into a sand pit and into a series of nets that finally you end up against a bunch of sand barriers that uh, can be lethal. And, and those nets have only been added recently in the last five, ten years, too. Well, uh, probably the design that you've seen. Um, and nets have been around as long as I've been driving, over 26 years. And I've ended up in them a, a couple of times for various reasons. Uh, usually there's, there's a parachute issue where I couldn't reach it. Um, for whatever reason, when I started driving, we had the parachutes mounted on the roof. Mm -hmm. So at 300 miles per hour, you stick your hand up out of the roll cage and you, you swipe these levers and out come the parachutes. That's where it was. That's where everybody had it. And uh, in, in 2006 at Pomona, which is our shortest track, I'm whipping down there and I go to reach for the parachutes and the engine blows and the roof raises just high enough that I cannot reach them with arm restraints on. And oh. uh, so the options are un you know, undo the seat belts to reach the parachutes, which is not going to happen, or get on the brakes and try and stop. And the way, the way it ended up was the car went into, into the sand, it flipped over the first net, catapulted over the second net, and landed right next to McKinley Avenue in a chain link fence. And, uh, public street yeah. broke my uh, yeah bro bro broke my tailbone and uh, I'm very sore um, and after that they did design some better nets that were taller that hopefully would catch you what is your advice for for drivers guys uh, getting started couple things uh, one thing that came along in, in my driving career that wasn't required that we uh, that actually you guys at GM had had a lot to do with was the Hans device in drag racing and not a whole lot of wrecks uh, in drag racing but I think in the early 2000s um, they brought them around and handed them out to every single driver out there in the in professional categories was got a Hans device from GM whether you were a GM racer or not and uh, I remember the first day putting it on and thinking, man, I just don't know. This thing could get in the way, and I need to get out in a hurry, and it's got, it's got problems, you know, in the roll cage. 
And, and one problem I had back then that I didn't realize, I had a lot of head and neck shoulder pain. At the end of a weekend, making eight runs down the quarter mile at over 300 miles per hour, the deceleration of the parachutes was just causing havoc on my neck. And I spent a lot of time just walking sideways, my wife having to help me get in and out of the car after the end of a weekend. And the very first run, when I hit the parachutes, I heard this <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? And it, it was the Hans device catching my head and neck under deceleration just on a regular run. And since that day in 2001, I've never been back to see any kind of uh, a chiropractor or neck problems. It's it was pretty amazing. That's great. And uh, deceleration is about three or four Gs, I believe? Uh, well, our G meter, just, it just pegs down, but I'm sure it has to be, it has to be more than that. To go from 300 miles per hour to, so you, to uh, yeah, yeah. it would slam me forward every single run. And... Uh, I, I couldn't imagine de you know, decelerating today into two parachutes without, without wearing some kind of head and neck restraint system. And uh, also, I would tell young people, you know, just sometimes you just have to look outside the box and do your own thing. Like the day I got the fresh air system or the, the breathing system, you know, if you know you're having a problem and it's within the rules, you know, it doesn't hurt to experiment or help yourself out a little bit. And even in 2010, when uh, things were going pretty well, you know, uh, Drag racing, we're kind of in our own little bubble there, and we kind of just take care of, we kind of just do our own thing, and we don't really make a whole lot of changes. And uh, Eves and his team and yourself, you reached out to us in drag racing about possibly looking at what else is out there. And, and working with Stan 21 and starting to wear their equipment has really opened up drag racing to where everybody's really increased their products since then.